important space for us, for me. Uh, you get off, say, let me take you to Fiji. You, you, you board the Air Pacific, the Airbus from Los Angeles, and you fly to Nandi International Airport. You disembark at the airport. The Nandi International Airport is a comparable international airport in terms of its affluence. It's a very affluent airport because Fiji's economy is predicated not only on sugarcane but on tourism as well. So a lot of investment has gone into tourism development. So you get off international airport, you go through immigration, and you go through the duty-free shops. It's just like you are in, still in Los Angeles. <laughs> and you get off, and you take your trolley, and you get to a taxi, or you get to a bus, and you see the buildings. The first sets of buildings are affluent buildings. But Fijians don't inhabit those buildings. And then you get in the taxi or you, you, you drive your rental car and you pass this, the infrastructures are relatively okay. And then you go through these buildings, the residential blocks, very affluent homes, and then you enter the first Fijian village and the scene changed drastically. Substandard homes, naked children running around. And then you pass the first Fijian village and you enter the city and it's a beautiful city. It's a tourist town. And, and then you enter the next village and it's a Fijian village and the scene changes again. And so my dissertation is trying to understand that. When you look at the settler colonial discourse, now that's been a when you read literatures that talks about colonization, you know how indigenous people are dispossessed, oppressed, marginalized, disempowered, you come up with all these terms. When you read that, Fiji is not often discussed as marginalized like the native Indians, the Native American Indians, the, the Canucks of New Caledonia, the Aborigines of Australia, the Maoris of New Zealand. The narratives are always that, you know, the British, Br British colonization was one of benevolent. It was benevolent. <laughs> they came to Fiji. They, they preserved the chiefly system in Fiji. They preserved the sense of indigeneity. And then they left. Oh, and they, pre and they also protected the land. You know, 83% of the land belongs to indigenous Fijians. It's protected. But it's, been, it's protected because it's leased out for economic development, not to Fijians, but to inv tourist investors and non-Fijians who engage in commercial agriculture. So when we talk about when we when we when we, when we talk about these things in this sacred space or in the space between us, this is the kind of things we don't often read. I grew up in a village, just as marginalized as any other Fijian. I grew up with my grandfather. I walked with him to the farm. The land in Fiji is divided into two. One, the, the best arable land is leased out. The marginal ones are for us for indigenous Fijians, for our subsistence livelihoods. So I grew up with my grandfather. And my grandfather would tell me, we, our land blood begins from here to there. We had about 200 acres of land. And yet we live in a substandard housing. And the, and the people who lease the land live in better homes, and they tend to, you know, tend to fare well in life. But landowners, we are landowners. <coughs> Our land is protected institutionally. But it's also been leased out institutionally. So what I'm talking about is the colonial institution of dispossession, the colonial institution of exploitation. That the British, British colonization was not benevolent. That colonization is colonization. 
the colonization essentially involved the imposition, the institutionalization, and the perpetuation of colonially of institutions of dispossession, institutions of evisceration, institutions of oppression and economic exploitation. So in this space, I want to talk about that. And just to be, and I want to be authentic as I can be. And that is why, in trying to understand the economic marginalization of indigenous Fijians, despite the institutional protection of our native land, I have embarked on this difficult journey. And I must tell you, it's difficult to read through literatures, to read through archives. And my heart cries out for my people. The story of my people has not been told from the margin. So I see myself as a person who stand in that space in between, in that sacred space, to talk about the story of a people who were oppressed, who were dispossessed. The story of dispossession that has been camouflaged by the politics of colonial benevolence. Thank you. Thank you.